I'm Christina. And I'm Tanya. And we are actually both DCE students at Concordia University, Texas. Whoosh! So you might be asking yourself, what is a DCE? I'll just give you a little bit of information on that. So DCE stands for Director of Christian Education. Director of Christian Education. Sometimes I get this wrong. Um, and basically, you might have one of these in your church, or that could be your youth pastor, it could be your children's minister, it just could be somebody in your church. But basically, we want to work with kids, um, and we want to work in as like a youth pastor. Some of them, some of us want to be a children's minister. Some of us want to work with adults in adult education, and some of us want to work with families and family life ministry. We kind of spread out over a broad spectrum, um, but we all love what we do, and we're all super excited to get to do that eventually one day. And part of our program is that every year, um, all of the people who are in the DCE program go to a camp. It's the HEB camp, which HEB, um, I don't know if you guys know about it. I definitely didn't until I moved to Texas, um, but it's like our grocery store. It's like the only grocery store that you shop at. Um, it stands for here, everything's better, or that's what someone told me. I don't think that's actually what it stands for. It stands for like Henry Edward Butts. I don't know, but the B is butts. <laughs> um, but anyways, we go to their camp, um, and it is this super awesome opportunity for all the DCE, um, all the DCE students from all the years to get together um, and just get to know each other. And um, it's like super like relaxed schedule. Um, we have mentor walks and swimming time and free time and Bible studies and just all kinds of things that we get to look forward to. Um, and it's just a super awesome opportunity for us to get to know one another. It's the major bonding event. It's the um, place where you really get to know all of your peers um, and just get to do a lot of super cool things. And so it was one of the things that I was most looking forward to as a first year DCE student. Yeah, I was super excited because not only had I been before, this was actually my second year. So I was a sophomore and I was so pumped because I didn't have such a great time my freshman year. So I was super excited to get to do that again, start a clean slate. I got to meet a bunch of new freshmen, a bunch of new people that were coming into the program, people that I would have classes with and just get to see on a regular basis, but also build better relationships with those that I did have classes with and get to know just the people that I was with. And so we had so many opportunities to just like hang out. We were all placed in small groups um, with small group leaders that were different seniors and juniors um, within the program. So we really got to build those relationships with them and get to talk to them a little bit more, which was an awesome opportunity. And I really enjoyed doing all that kind of stuff. And I was super excited just to get to meet um, some of those juniors and seniors, especially so then they could talk about like what they're going through and like what our jobs and what our lives look like I guess in two or three years for some of us. And I was also super excited to get to meet all the freshmen because then we just get to like build some of those new friendships. And I was super pumped to just like have some new friends, like get to do stuff and like get to hang out. We all got to like live together for a couple of days. We got to like sleep in bunk beds, stay up late. And it was just kind of like a, a fun girl time in the cabin. It was like summer camp, honestly but for just like a few days. And I had worked at summer camp before I got there. And so this was just like, supposed to be like a little piece of heaven because I loved summer camp so much and I loved working there. So I was super excited for these two or three days because it's supposed to be like a little piece of heaven, like a little piece of camp back in my school time, but with all these people I would spend my next few years at school with. And so I was just over the moon, like excited to get to meet people and get to do this experience with people. And then we got there. Don't get me wrong, the DCE retreat was still so awesome. And the highs were so high. Like, I met some of my absolute best friends my first year. <laughs> um, and there were so many fun times. I mean, we had an indoor campfire because it was raining and I tried a s'more with a Reese's on it instead of a chocolate on it for the very first time. Um, we got to swim in like some little water hole thing um, and jump off of cliffs into it, which was just such a like over the top experience, just so much fun. 
Um, we got to do a lot of things that were so, so awesome. Like, like I said, the highs were so, so high. Yeah, I'm so thankful that we got those experiences. I really wish that more departments and like more people would get to do that kind of stuff because it took our relationships from just in class, like, ah, that's my friend and my acquaintance in math class to, hey, that's like my real friend. Like we hang out and we like do things. And it helped us to like build some of those deeper relationships and just really get to know people on a more personal level rather than just like in classes and stuff. So I'm incredibly thankful for like our professors and the students that set this up for us because like it was such an awesome time. There were really great things that we got to do. Like I specifically remember like um, whenever, it was like raining the entire weekend that we were there, which kind of sucked, but it was super cool because there was one morning where we had kind of gotten up early. We had gone on a hike, it was a sunrise hike and um, the sun kind of was coming out of the clouds when we got to the top of the mountain, kind of wasn't, but then all of a sudden the sun just like split through the clouds and for like a brief moment there was just sunshine on this mountain top and we just got to sit um, with all of our peers and our classmates and just watch the sunrise and enjoy those like few moments of just like pure bliss and like happiness. And afterwards I remember we went down, it started raining again and we just like stood outside and had our cups of coffee and we ate our breakfast and it was just such like a beautiful outside moment of just getting to really like bond with each other doing that mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah, and I'd go again a thousand times. I will never skip a DCE retreat regardless. Um, they, they were so awesome. They have been so awesome. Even they just super rocked. But, but it, was it was the lows, lows for us. us. Those were really low. I remember walking away from that experience and just only remembering the lows. Like, I just felt really sad and just, I didn't feel like I fit in or I belonged. Like sp specifically, I remember we had an indoor fire. Um, it was just in a big fireplace and because it, cause it was raining outside and we were all sitting around and we had this opportunity to go around and everyone was supposed to share something that they were super thankful for from this retreat um, and just kind of something along those lines. And everyone went around and they shared and it was all stuff like, well, I'm so glad that we're such a big family. I love that we all get to hang out together and that I can just be my real true self with you guys and that everyone just accepts me and I just feel so loved and so welcomed. Then it got to my turn and I was at a loss for words. I had nothing to say. I didn't feel loved and welcomed and like I could be myself with these people. I felt left out. I felt sad. I felt like I didn't belong. This was supposed to be something that was supposed to be super exciting. Like we were supposed to be like the cool kids. Like <laughs> this is supposed to be fun. And I didn't feel that happiness in, in that at all. I felt just sad and I felt lonely. I felt like God had like dropped me off in this retreat and said, peace out, Christina, good luck. Like I'll see you next time. And I just didn't know what to do in that moment. It just felt like a huge trial for me. Yeah, the DCE retreat overall was supposed to be this mountaintop experience where I didn't lose my smile for a single second and there was glitter in the sand and peaches on the trees. Um, but it quickly turned into something that had some trials in it. And in those trials, I was sad. Um, but I, I knew what God had to say about trials. And he says, consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Um, and when I thought of this verse, it stopped making sense to me. This verse didn't fit in my brain anymore because I felt sad and I knew that it was okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel sad. But in this verse, I was being told to be happy. And I was like, how can I be happy and sad at the same time? That's not a thing that happens. You can't be happy and sad yeah like in those moments where was that happiness like i felt so low like i felt like i was like at <laughs> at the depths of a pit and just felt so completely sad how are we supposed to feel happy in those moments like where is this happiness coming from where is this joy coming from that he speaks of so much in these verses but 
our God, he, he is so intentional. He's so intentional with his words. And definitely in this verse, I think he was showing us, reminding us that joy is not happiness. There's a reason why God put the word joy in this verse and not happy. He didn't say, be happy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials. He said, consider it great joy. He didn't say, smile in the depths and put on a happy face. No, he said, consider it joy. So where is joy even found? Psalm 16 tells us, you reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. This tells us that joy isn't happiness, it's being in God's presence. And then Psalm 94, verse 18 says, When I said, my foot is slipping, your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your comfort brought me joy. Joy still isn't that happiness. It was found in the comfort of him. And Proverbs 10 verse 28 says, the hope of the righteous is joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. This tells us again, joy is not happiness. Joy is the hope of the righteous. And then finally in 1 Chronicles chapter 16 verse 27, it says, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Again, joy is still not happiness. Joy is in his dwelling place with him. From this, we can know that joy and happiness are not the same thing. There's a difference in them. And that joy is something that we can possess and that we can have even in those weaknesses and even in those sad times because joy comes from Jesus. Joy is the hope of Jesus. Joy is the love, the comfort. It's in his presence and in his dwelling place is where we can find that joy and that joy of tomorrow and just that never ending eternal joy, not never ending eternal happiness. It doesn't say that joy is all smiles and sparkles in the sand or peaches on the tree. No, there's a difference between the two. And so he's telling us that we don't have to smile through it. We don't have to be perfect and smile through all of these trials all the time. Yeah, Christ in his word, when we look at truth, when we, um, when we look at the things that Christ tells us, we realize that when a verse doesn't make sense, it's because God has something different in mind. And so God doesn't want us to be all happy all the time. He wants us to feel every emotion he's given us, but he wants us to know um, that we're always in his presence. He wants us to know that our joy is constant because he is constant. Um, and he paints this beautiful picture of us that he's got us. Um, and even when it sometimes doesn't feel like he's got us, he's still there. And when it doesn't feel like we have this joy, we still do have this joy. Yeah, because joy resides in his dwelling place. Joy does, resides in his house. And in that Holy Spirit that lives within each and every one of us and in that belief in him. And that's where our joy comes from. Our joy comes from the Lord mm -hmm. and from the hope of Jesus and in from that Holy Spirit that resides within us so that we can carry joy with us wherever we go. No matter what sorrows we face, no matter what sadness, no matter what lows we go with. <laughs> And we can still have that joy and that love of Jesus Christ, knowing that he's got us and that we don't need to worry about anything. He did give us emotions and he allows us to feel those emotions. He allows us to feel sad, like Tanya has said, but we still have that joy. And there's another place in the Bible where God paints this beautiful and clear picture of exactly what we're talking about. This idea that joy is so much more than happiness. Joy is so much more than a feeling. Um, and it comes from the true story that can be found in the Gospel of John in the 16th chapter. So this section that we're gonna read from is called The Disciples' Grief Will Turn to Joy. So just to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of history, um, just so you have some information as to what's going on here. Um, Jesus has invited the disciples over for dinner, and this is also the same dinner where he washes the disciples' feet. 
And this is also the same where he said, he tells Peter that, hey, like, you're going to deny me a couple of times, like, just so you know. And this is also where um, he tells the disciples that someone is going to um, betray him. And Judas knows that it's him. So he skedaps out of the dinner real quick after that. <laughs> and this is just a time where the disciples are asking Jesus some questions. And at one point, Jesus tells them, like, hey, I'm not going to be around much longer. And that's where we're going to pick up right here in John chapter 16, verse 16. Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more. And then after a little while you will see me. Real, real, real clear right there. <laughs> so great. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> at some point, at this, some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more. And then after a little while you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus knew they wanted to ask him. And so he said to them, are you asking one another about what I said? A little while and you will not see me. Again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that a person has been born into the world. So you also have sorrow now. But I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy from you. During this time, he is talking to his disciples, and at one point he says, um, that without him that the world is going to rejoice but they're going to weep and mourn so the disciples had like devoted their life to this guy and had given everything to follow this guy because he said that he is the messiah he is lord and he has shown them so many ways that he is lord and so many different things and the world was going to rejoice during this time the world kind of hated jesus he was a radical. He was um, taking things and flipping things upside down, which is something that they didn't really like at all. And the world really wanted to get rid of him. And so he was telling the disciples that they're going to weep and mourn while the world rejoices because they're going to have to live in a world without Jesus. Mm -hmm. This time of sorrow that Jesus refers to in this passage is this idea of living in a world without Jesus, right? And so these disciples, like Christina was saying, they were going to experience some real sadness um, because they dropped literally everything to follow Jesus, literally everything. Um, I mean, like they were working, they were fishing, they were doing whatever job, whatever labor they had devoted their entire lives to. And they dropped it in the instant that God told them to follow him and they walked away with him. And so then now this idea of really having to be without Jesus for a little while was hard and it was real um, and it was not joyful because it was without Jesus mm -hmm. but we never have to experience this sorrowful time because we never have to live in a life without Jesus yeah Jesus died on that cross and he rose again and he tells us also in this section whenever he says that i will see you again he's not just telling them that he's going to see him in three days after he resurrects out of that tomb he's telling us that he is coming back for us here on earth and that he loves us so much and that we will never have to feel that pain that the disciples had to feel in that moment in a world without jesus because we will always have jesus yeah and we're we're never going to give up that hope and not that the not that the disciples had, disciples had completely given up their hope because they knew what Jesus said to them, but they didn't know exactly what was going to happen. They didn't get to know the end of the story, but we do get to know the end of the story. So again, when it says that our joy is in the hope of Jesus, we always have the hope of Jesus. And it says that our joy is in the dwelling place of Jesus. Well, we know that Jesus dwells within us. And so that joy is always, always, always going to be within us. Mm -hmm. And it especially points us back to the cross. And when Jesus died on the cross, his famous last words 
the things that um, we think about probably in so many Bible studies that we've done, the words, it is finished. And when he declared that, he declared, it is finished. This feeling of sorrow, it is finished. You're never going to have to experience a life without the hope of me and the joy of me. Mm -hmm. He doesn't tell us that we're not going to feel sorrow and we're never going to feel sadness and we're never going to feel pain. He tells us in James that we're going to go through trials and we're going to go through tribulations and we're going to have pain and we're going to go through all of these horrible things, but we will always have joy because we always have Jesus. He said it is finished. Therefore, we will always be surrounded by him. And when he spoke those words, we had the Holy Spirit within us. And he was saying that you on earth will no longer have to feel that pain and that sorrow mm -hmm. without joy, without yeah. the hope of him and the hope of him coming. Mm -hmm. And he says, no one will take away your joy from you. And he means it. He means that even when someone makes you feel sad, they don't get to take your joy. Even when someone beats you down, they don't get to take your joy. And that is so awesome. And that is a true promise. So in this, he is not telling us that joy equals happiness and that we have to smile through it all and that it's always going to be sparkles in the sand and peaches in the tree. No, he's telling us that joy is something that is going to be there even through the pain, even through the sadness, and even through the sorrow. So that joy and happiness and that excitement and that beautiful, perfect smile all the time are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Life is not going to be a piece of cake. It wasn't it's not meant to be. I mean, we are meant to face trials so that way we can draw nearer to our Lord. And even though it's not fun and God doesn't want us to be sad, he doesn't want us to be sorrowful. That's the reality of the broken world. But we still have Jesus in all of it and we learn and we grow so, so much from it. Mm -hmm. And especially in today's day and age, like this world is so uncertain. There's so much sorrow and so much pain that surrounds us on our day-to-day -day basis. And there's so much uncertainty, uncertainty for the future, uncertainty for next week. I haven't even, I don't even know what I'm going to do tomorrow sometimes. Like it's, it's all just a mess all the time. It seems like, and we don't know what to do sometimes, but we know that this is truth. And this truth tells us that through those pains, through that sorrow, through that uncertainty, we will always have joy and that we can always be certain of that joy and that that joy will last and stand through all trials and tribulations. Just like whenever we went on that DCE retreat that like there was sorrow and there were lows, like lows. But looking back on it, we can finally see those highs and we can finally see the joy that came out of that. And sometimes we're not always gonna see the joy. And sometimes we're not always gonna feel that joy. We're gonna go through pain and we're gonna feel like we're lost and that God isn't around. But we can always know that we have joy because he tells us we have joy. Yeah, we have truth in our hands. Truth, unchanging truth, unshakable truth, undeniable truth here. And this truth tells us that sometimes we might feel like we're far away from God, but God has never left us out in the dust. He's never left us on the other side of the shore. He's never let go of us. He always has us. He's always right there next to us. And truth tells us that sometimes we are going to feel like we are so far from joy that we'll never feel again. But the truth is that no matter what, we always have joy. We always have Jesus. Um, and that's never going to be taken away from us. So even when we feel these sadnesses, when we face these trials, when we are in a time um, where we feel like sorrow is the only thing that we have, that's just not the reality because we're always gripped by joy. So if we want you guys to walk away with anything from this lesson and from all of these verses today is just knowing that Jesus loves you and that Jesus died on that cross so that we can walk around and we can know that through our pain, through our trials, through our tribulations, through all of the sorrow, all of the anger, and all the things that just come at us in this world, we can know that we are always gripped by joy. We are always held by joy because we are always held by Jesus. He died on that cross so that we could know
that we are held by him and that we are loved by him. And all of that just shows us that joy is in everything that we do and that joy is with us to the end of the age and until the moment that he comes back to give us that ultimate freedom and that ultimate joy with him. Mm -hmm. And so much more than that, um, just this idea that there is hope for us. There's hope for the whole wide world because Jesus came and he died for each and every one of us. Um, and he gave us access to the Father. He gave us access to this joy um, and to this love and to so, so much. And nothing is ever going to separate us from that. Nothing's ever going to take it away from us. So we're going to end in a word of prayer. If you want, I'll dial you hang up. <laughs> you dial, I'll hang up. <laughs> awesome. Pray with us. Dear God, Heavenly Father, um, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing all of us together on this beautiful planet. Um, we thank you for the breath in our lungs and for the feet that we have to stand. Lord, I just, I thank you for just the blessing, the many blessings that you have given us on this earth, Lord. I thank you for joy, Lord. I thank you for this never ending joy that just lasts through the days and through the age. And Lord, I just thank you for, for dying on that cross, for sending your son to die on that cross for us. And that you had our name written on your hearts whenever you died on that cross for us. And that you just, you love us. And that you love us so much that you gave us joy to feel and to have through all of those pains and through all of those trials. And that you were just thinking about us whenever you went through so much pain and went through so much hardship, Lord. I just thank you so much for that joy, that, that never-ending joy that comes from you and you alone, Lord. Lord. I thank you for declaring it finished, um, God, that you give us you and you give us you completely, Lord. You give us your love um, and your affection always and forever, Lord. Um, you are such an awesome God and we love you so, so much. In your son's living, dying, rising, and reigning name I pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. So, guys, we want you to go out there and live life like you're gripped by joy. It doesn't mean you have to smile all the time and that you have to be perfect all the time. Even though we know you are perfect and you are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you through don't. Jesus. Through Jesus. Through Jesus. You don't have to smile 24-7. You can feel pain. You can feel sorrow. But just know that you are gripped by joy. <laughs>